It started in 455 BC. There shall be seven weeks, that's the 49 years, then 62 weeks. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. If we take these seven weeks plus the 62 weeks, where do we arrive in the timeline of history? The actual month of Jesus' triumphal entry. After the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. So something very significant happens and it impacts all of us. It's the reason we can't say that Jesus will return on this date is because we're in Daniel chapter 9. I'm just going to cover three verses this morning, 25 through 27, but they are packed with so many powerful details about end time prophecy. They're packed with so many details about history and what is to come and, and God's timetable. Let, let's just bow our heads and ask the Holy Spirit to open this up to us so that we can understand and marvel at the beautiful prophetic picture that God has given us here of the end times through his servant Daniel. Father, we thank you this morning for scripture. We thank you for the prophets. We thank you for the prophet Daniel, God, who served uh, 67 years in Babylon, Lord, under heathen kings, Lord, but he was still faithful to seek you and study the word, and you brought amazing prophetic things through him that have implications on the times we live in now and on the last days that lie ahead of us. Father, we pray this morning that you would open the eyes of our understanding by the Holy Spirit, that we could see how these things work and we could marvel together about the goodness of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 27, listen closely. Now there, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, say command, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until, say until, until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. After the 62 weeks, verse 26, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Then the end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now there's a lot of imagery in there, there's a lot of implications in there, and we need to dig through it to get all of what God has for us, but I guarantee by the time we get to the end, all of this is going to make sense to you. So Daniel humbled himself, he cried out to God, he prayed, he offered supplications, he covered himself in sackcloth and in ashes, he fasted, amen. How many know Daniel got desperate? Yes. Yes. Some of us are one act of desperation away from really getting God's attention, you know, I've never gotten desperate for God, hungry for God, thirsty for God, and have him turn me away. But yet when I've been apathetic or lukewarm in my pursuit, sometimes the heavens were brass. It's desperation that God is looking for in his people. It's desperation that God is looking for in those who thirst for righteousness and hunger for righteousness. God wants to see us get intense with our pursuit of him. When Daniel got intense, God showed up. In verse 24, Gabriel, the angel, came. How many would like to ask God for an answer to a, a question in prayer and have an angel show up to spoon feed it to you? Amen? We talked about this. The angel Gabriel, one of what Bible scholars think are two of the archangels mentioned in Scripture, the other being Michael. Gabriel shows up. He's a herald. He gives God's news. He's a messenger. He tells Daniel the timeline of God's plan. Why? Because Daniel the prophet had been studying the prophet Jeremiah, and he'd come to the conclusion that Israel's bondage and captivity in Babylon would be 70 years and he'd been there 67 so he's like it's almost time to go let's get in God's face and let's get desperate so we can have God's best 
for the Jewish people and for himself. He's really honing in here. Gabriel shows up and says, hold on. God's going to show you the big picture. You're seeing a little bit of the picture, but I want you to see the big picture. And God's going to give him the timeline of what he's going to do to restore the Jewish people and Jerusalem. And it's going to take a little bit longer than Gabriel had anticipated. He tells him it will take a period of 70 weeks. Now, before we go on any further, let's define exactly what is meant here by 70 weeks. It's not a literal seven-day period, but you're going to see how this breaks down and how it fulfills itself through history is that one week equals seven years. So you, you, if you ever had a really long Monday, th that's what he's talking about. You ever had a Monday that felt like a year? Come on, some of you need to loosen up a little bit this morning. One week equals seven years. So 70 weeks adds up to 490 years. He says it's going to take 490 years of Israel's history for me to deal with them and to get them in order so that I can do the things you're asking me to do, Daniel. So during that 70 weeks period, uh, we learned last time we were together that what? It's, it's going to take uh, 490 years to do six things, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Within those six things are exactly what Daniel's asking for, the restoration and the salvation of the Jewish people, the rejection of Messiah has cut them off, and yet they're going to accept Messiah when he returns again. All Israel will be saved in a day. He's going to restore the temple. He's going to restore uh, all of these things that have been broken and taken away, but it's going to take a period of 70 weeks, 490 years. Are we still together? Yes. You look like a class of algebra students that are just going, <laughs> hang in there. It's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> so we're, we're going to see some things happen in this 70 week period. We understand it's 490 years, a week equaling seven years. Let's begin by unwrapping the historical uh, precise gem of verse 25. Verse 25 is amazing when we unpack it. It says here, no, now therefore, no, I keep calling that now. I can't see the, uh, I'm going to have to get thicker glasses that I'm not wearing. So <laughs> know therefore and understand. So he's saying, you got to understand this, that from the going forth of the command, remember I had you highlight that word command, to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, it's going to take seven weeks and 62 weeks. So we, we, the first stop is we've got to define this thing about a command. And we're going to see that in verse 25, it's telling us that a command is going to be given to begin the restoration of Jerusalem, the wall, and the streets. Now, if you remember, Jerusalem had been leveled. It had been sacked. The temple was destroyed. The Jews were slaughtered, and the ones who were and killed were carried away into a captivity in Babylon, and Daniel was one of them. So right now, Israel and its situation, the people are not in their homeland. The temple is destroyed. It's a mess. So he's saying there's going to be a command given to start the rebuilding of the temple and of the streets of Jerusalem. Now, 70 years later, which, you know, amazingly is the duration of their captivity, a command was given in history by Artaxerxes and Artaxerxes commanded the prophet Nehemiah to go back and to begin to rebuild Jerusalem. You remember the prophet Jeremiah. You remember he rebuilt the wall. He did it with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. It was perilous times, yet they rebuilt the wall. Who gave the command? Artaxerxes. When did he do it? After the 70 years captivity. That command given by Artaxerxes is the starting point of the 490 years. Here's a heathen king who has nothing to do with the living God or the Jewish people, yet God moves to him and, and moves on his heart, and he tells his servant, Nehemiah, who is his cupbearer, go back and rebuild your homeland. How many think that in itself is of a miracle? Not only did he command it to be done, he paid for it. Hello? 
Not, ah, you go figure it out, go raise an offering, go do it. No, he's like, I'm paying for it. You go back, go, go do it. Uh, you know, that is a miracle. But that, you say, well, how did that happen? It happened because God ordained it to happen that way. So he gives this command, and they go back, and they begin to rebuild Jerusalem. Seventy years later, after the captivity, the command is given. The 490-year uh, process begins. The 70-week begins at Artaxerxes' command. Now, that happened in four. 45 BC. So this is the starting point, but the text also determines that there will be a finish line. Look what it says. Going from the fourth of the command, we know that's Artaxerxes, to restore and build Jerusalem. That's what Daniel's praying for. When is the finish line? Until Messiah the Prince. So understand there's going to be a starting place, and that happened with Artaxerxes' command. Nehemiah goes back, and he says there's a finish line to this, and it's when Messiah Messiah the prince shows up. Now, if you look at this, uh, you realize that there are some really nice bookends given here in history. We got a command, and now we've got a starting place and a finish line. That from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the prince. The finish line is the presentation of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people as Messiah. That when the Jews see this man come and claim to be Messiah, they're going to get an opportunity to receive him. And if you look at this, you're saying, well, how do these time periods work out? Well, it took Daniel, I mean, I'm sorry, it took Nehemiah seven weeks. That's 49 years. It took him 49 years to repair the wall and the streets of Jerusalem. How many think that's a big coincidence, 49 years? No? It sounds like God's hand is in this, amen? Are you tracking with me? Because you, you, you're looking scary on me out there. Okay, so Nehemiah goes back 70 weeks. That's the time it took. It started in 455 BC. It says then what? Plus 62 weeks. Look at that. There shall be seven weeks. That's the 49 years. Nehemiah built the wall. Then 62 weeks added to that. The streets shall be built again, and even in the troublesome times. We know that's Nehemiah. And after the 62 weeks, here we go, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So we got a starting point and a finish line. Now, where do we land in the timetable of history if we take these seven weeks plus the 62 weeks, if we take 70 years uh, plus the 334 years, where do we arrive in the timeline of history? Well, stunningly, we arrive at the, 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 the actual month of Jesus's triumphal entry. Now, if you, if you didn't say wow right there, you didn't understand what I said. <laughs> Because what did I say the finish line was? It was the presentation of Messiah to his people. Right. And so Artaxerxes gives the command. The process starts. We got the, we got the seven weeks uh, plus the 62 when we get to there. And what happens in time? Now listen to me. Artaxerxes gave that command to rebuild the temple in the Jewish calendar's month of Nisan. Do you know when Jesus showed up for the triumphal entry? The same amount of years predicted later in the month of Nisan. He shows up and he presents himself to the Jewish people as Messiah. And we see it. He comes in in Luke 19, 36 through 44. Uh, he is presented to the Jewish people as Messiah. And this is how they receive him. Now he was going. They were spreading their cloaks on the road. You remember this? They had the palm branches. As soon as he approached near uh, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. Yet some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you, if these stop speaking, the stones will cry out. Let's just stop there for a second. What is Jesus saying? He's saying this isn't a spontaneous thing. This isn't just a, a, a crowd that's affectionate towards me. This is ordained by God. I'm being presented to the Jewish people here, and if they don't respond this way, the rocks would cry out. Why? Because God ordained this. This is a moment in their history to either receive me or reject me. It says, 
that uh, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known on this day, even you, the conditions for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. He realizes their receiving of him is superficial, and soon this same crowd that's yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, is going to yell, crucify him, give us Barabbas. Verse 43, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will be put a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and throw down your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Wow. Do you realize the implications of what I just said there? Jesus is saying, I'm here. I'm being presented to you as Messiah. You're superficially receiving me, but you're going to reject me. And you you have not recognized your time of visitation. What does that mean? He came for them, yet his own received him not. He came as Messiah, yet they didn't recognize him. They prayed for thousands of years. They studied the prophets. They knew all the prophecies. Yet when Jesus stood right in front of them, they said, this is not what we wanted. And they rejected him. And they crucified him. And Jesus wept, and he understood what was happening here. This was a God-ordained moment. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks, 434 years, he comes right to this place in history. He's presented at the triumphal entry, yet they are superficially receiving him, but soon they will reject him quickly, and the mob will call for his execution, which brings us right to the end of 62 weeks, 434 days, and right into verse 26. Verse 26 says, after the 62 weeks, so we've got these uh, seven weeks and the 62 weeks, we're coming right up to 69. Uh, What's gonna happen? Messiah will be cut off. Listen to this. After the 62 weeks, Um, If you're good at math, you realize we're, we're up to that 69 and we're only going to 70. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now that phrase cut off there in the original language in the Hebrew literally means to be killed or put to death. And we know that that's exactly what happened to Jesus after the triumphal entry, didn't they? Hosanna, 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 woo! Palm leaves and a big crowd and everybody clapping. The religious people are mad and soon the crowd would turn and say, crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas. Wow. It's a moment in history. It's their time of visitation. Yet there's a rejection taking place that God knew would happen. There's a powerful detail here. It says, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Did you pick that up? Jesus didn't die for himself. Jesus didn't die to start a religion. Jesus didn't die to become famous. No, he shall be cut off, put to death, but not for himself. That's an interesting detail. Why? Because how would Daniel know that Jesus was coming to lay his life down as a redeemer, as a Messiah, to lay his life down for sins? He he wouldn't have known that at that point. Even studying, he's prophesying about something he doesn't understand and he doesn't know coming. Uh, You know, the, the, the Jesus that they thought was coming was a military leader, yet this is, this is not who he is. And he prophesies that he's going to come and he's going to die, but not for himself. That's interesting when you look at what John the Baptist said in John 1 29. John saw Jesus coming and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. That's Jesus. He's the Lamb whose blood was shed to break the power of sin over our lives. Amen. Come on, give him praise this morning. So we've got these years coming down. We're into the 69th week out of 70. Uh, Daniel 9.26, the prophet Daniel foretells exactly who would carry out the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, the people of the prince who is to come. Now, that's an interesting thing to say. The people. So uh, the prince who is to come is a reference to the Antichrist. We know that because there's other places in scriptures where it it talks like that. So the people of the prince who is to come means the the people, uh, the nation who the Antichrist will come out of, the people. Now, through history, we know who the people are. Why? Because the Romans are the ones, and history tells us so, that leveled Jerusalem. After Messiah is cut off, 
off and he's crucified. What happens? Years later, the Romans come and they level Jerusalem. They kill 1.5 million Jews. They scatter the rest all over the world, the diaspora. They scatter them everywhere. God's people are not in their homeland. And then they destroy the temple so thoroughly, not one stone lays upon another, just as Jesus said. It was the Romans who did that. So the people of the prince who is to come. In here is a little clue, a little clue about what nation the Antichrist will rise up from. Now, it doesn't tell us ethnicity, but it gives us a clue about the nation. The people of the prince who is to come, well, that's the Romans. So here Daniel's giving us a hint that Antichrist will rise out of a revived Roman Empire. Remember when I talked to you about the statue we studied in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? We got to the feet of clay and iron with the ten toes. And they symbolized what? Ten nations uh, that had Roman influence, and that is the European Union. So we see, how many realize the European Union exists right now, and the revived Roman Empire is happening through those ten toes, and that's where the Antichrist is going to come out of. We don't know his ethnicity. Some people think he's going to be Greek. Some people think he's Italian. Some people think he's Jewish. We don't know for sure. But I want to tell you, uh, when he comes, the world is not going to see it coming. And those who are not walking with Jesus are, are not going to be able to discern who he is. So the angel Gabriel is giving this vision here. Uh, the, the Romans do what the Romans were foretold to do. They sack Jerusalem. All God's people are scattered after Messiah's death, and it is definitely a revived Roman Empire that will perpetrate these things on Israel and that the Antichrist will rise up from. Let's look at verse 27. Are you still with me? Yes. All right. So verse 27 then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Remember, one week is seven years. So the, the Antichrist, that's he. He's going to confirm a covenant. He's going to broker a deal, a peace agreement. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall one who make desolation, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So in verse 27, we have a lot of moving pieces, and we're going to define them there. Uh, the verse 27 starts by telling us Antichrist is going to broker a covenant. It's a peace deal. And who's it between? Israel and and its adversaries. Just the fact that Israel is a nation at this point is a miracle. Do you realize after the Jews were scattered, after they were, you know, the Romans just scattered them all over the face of the earth, they weren't a nation again until 1948 after World War II. In 1948, Jesus, uh, um, Jesus, Jerusalem, the homeland was given back to the Jews and they were once again the nation. Bible teachers and scholars who studied eschatology before this happened in the 40s here, they didn't understand what God was talking about, Israel and the home. There, there was none. And we have so much more light and so much more clarity now that history has unfolded and we see that once again they're a nation and God's going to deal with them as a nation. Well, the Antichrist is going to broker a peace deal with them. Now, it's, it's amazing. The Romans crushed them. Hitler's Third Reich tried to snuffed them out and killed six million of them. He, he would have finished the job if he could, but God didn't allow it. And, and years later, in 48, they become a nation again. It's just a miracle how God has his hand still on his people. So there's going to be this peace deal. Now understand, Israel is surrounded by neighbors that want to destroy them. I know you're comfortable and every, all of us are well fed and we're clothed and most of us are in our right mind. But we don't even probably realize that Israel is still fighting a two-front war against its neighbors. It's not in the news cycle anymore. It's old news. It's gone on for over a year. People don't want to talk about it, especially during election season. But Israel is still fighting. They're in actual, uh, you know, hot combat right now uh, with the two-front war. And their neighbors want to destroy them. And it's always been that way. You know, whether it was the Romans or the Nazis or their neighbors, they, they have constantly been in conflict. So sure, they're going to be yearning for peace. Did you ever fight so much you didn't want to fight no more? Did you ever have conflict with somebody so much you're like, enough? Well, that's where Israel is. 
And Antichrist is going to waltz right in and exploit their hunger for peace. And he's going to kind of rope them into a deal. We're not sure of the parameters of it, but we know it's not going to be a, a good deal or a lasting deal. But he's going to waltz in and he's going to do what no one else has been able to do. He's going to broker Middle East peace. Do you know every president and every politician and every world leader for decades has tried to broker peace in the Middle East? Yes. You can remember Reagan, Jimmy Carter. I remember Jimmy Carter shaking hands with the, you know, the, the leader of this group and the leader of that. And they're like, oh, we finally got Middle East peace and it never lasts. And, and Bush tried it and Clinton tried it and, and Trump tried it. And, uh, and it's always a short duration. Why? Because there won't be peace there until the Prince of Peace comes and restores order in the Middle East. But Antichrist being the quintessential liar and slick manipulator is going to come in there and seemingly do what no one else has been able to do. He's going to get peace in the Middle East. And the, the world's going to applaud and laud him and eventually worship him for the things he does that no one else could do. And it's just an amazing thing to see here that, you know, he gets this deal done. But the deal was for one week, seven years. But in the middle of that period, that's three and a half years, the Antichrist will break the deal and turn on the Jews and try and destroy them. The book of Revelation shows this vividly in how, you know, he turns on them and tries to destroy them. And God himself has to protect them. So he breaks the seven-year peace deal, and he does it in the middle, and that marks the tribulation from the great tribulation. Revelation teaches what? There's going to be a tribulation and then a great tribulation. When does it shift from just regular trib to, you know, this wicked season? Well, right in the middle at 3.5 years. And what initiates that? The Antichrist breaking the treaty with Israel. So, you, you know, you're going to see that uh, we've got one week left. We've up to 69. We've got one week left and you say, well, what is that one week? Remember, one week is seven years. So the seven years is the seven-year tribulation period. Are you getting this? There's your 70th week of Daniel. So the, verse, the rest of verse 27 describes what the Antichrist will do when he breaks this deal and goes after Israel. You see all these things about on the wing of abominations and he'll be made desolate and eventually the consummation will be determined by desolation. So he, remember, he's been called the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist, twice in Daniel and in 1 Thessalonians and in other places in scriptures, he's referred to as the abomination of desolation. What's that all about? That's about what he's gonna do when he gets in the position to break that treaty and put himself in a place of power. He is going to end the daily sacrifice in the temple. That's what it says here. But in the middle of the week, the middle of the tribulation, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Why is that significant? Because if the Jews have finally reconstituted their temple and they're giving offerings to God in the morning and the evening, now they can satisfy the Mosaic law covenant and have a relationship with God. But the Antichrist is going to come in and say, no, no more offerings to him. That's going to stop right now. You can't have a relationship with God. And then what is he going to do? He's going to present himself in the temple. That's the abomination. And he's going to present himself to be God and demand to be worshipped. This is what Daniel says. This is what the book of Revelation says. This is what the scripture says in the New Testament. So understand the chain of events that are coming here. When Antichrist is revealed, he's going to be a slick guy. He's going to be smooth and charismatic, but he's going to turn into the devil he is. Halfway through, he's going to persecute Israel. He's going to break the treaty. He's going to present himself as God. He's going to stop the worship of God, and he's going to say, everybody has to worship me. And we know the book of Revelation says what? That you have to take a mark in your forehead or your right hand or you won't be able to buy and sell. You have to worship the beast or you'll be cut off. Aren't you glad that God's made provision for the church not to be here during that time? Yeah. Yeah. Almost, 
85 to 95 percent of the body of Christ at this time with all the the things that have fallen into place realize that we are going to be raptured pre-trib some people think it's mid-trib we're going to be here until it really gets bad and and the church is going to get beat up a little bit some people think it's post-trib we're going to go through the whole thing and be martyred but listen to me scripture is pretty clear that this time when God is dealing in the seven year tribulation it has nothing to do with the church it has everything to do with the Jews it's the time of Jacob's trouble. The church is not mentioned in the book of Revelation from chapter 4 to chapter 19. Why? It talks about the saints. Those are those who refuse to take the mark of the beast and, 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 and receive Christ then, but the church is not mentioned. Why? Because it's not there, because this isn't the time for the church. And we're going to see in our timeline in just a little bit that there's a great explanation of when the church would be removed for this to happen. So uh, you're going to see some things fall into place here. Um, in the New Testament, Paul confirms that this would happen. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 5, he says, No one is to deceive you in any way, for it not will come lest there is an apostasy first, so a great falling away, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the reveal of the Antichrist, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God, oh, an object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. This is what Paul says Antichrist is going to do. And so uh, it's something that, you know, uh, the world is not going to be ready for. Israel's going to be in a tough situation. The time of Jacob's trouble, it's told when this happens that the, the people are to flee and head to the mountains of Judea. They're not even to look back or go back to their house or take anything. They're going to have to run immediately. Why? Because the hunt is going to be on for the destruction of the Jewish people. So something very significant happens between verse 26 and 27, and it impacts all of us. It's the reason we can't say that Jesus will return on this date, 490 years after Artaxerxes gave the decree to rebuild, because otherwise we can count down history and say Jesus should have came then. The reason we can't say that is because there's a period of time between Messiah being cut off and, and uh, Messiah returning. And that period of time in there is called the gap, and that's the church age. You see, what happened when Jesus died and rose again, soon after that, on the day of Pentecost, he empowered his disciples, and the church of Jesus Christ was born, amen, in the gap. What happened with the nation of Israel? When they rejected Messiah and they crucified him, their 490-year countdown came to a screeching halt. Why? Because they put everything on pause by rejecting Messiah. Those seven years that have to take place to finish the 490, they will be the seven year tribulation are you getting this now if that was if that's all there was to it we should have been able to tell the month and the day that jesus would come back but the church age is a nondescript period we don't know how long the church age is going to be but we are the church of jesus christ amen and while we're here we need to preach the gospel we need to save souls we need to worship the lord amen we need to do all the things that the church needs to do to work and to bring in a harvest yes there's going to be apostasy yes there's going to be a falling away but our job is to bring the gospel to the world you see well when's the church age going to end i don't know We can see the signs of the time coming. We can see the signs that Jesus said to watch out for. And a lot of us think we got to be pretty close. But it's a non-determined period, and it happens in the gap between the 69th week that ended at Messiah being cut off and the 70th week that happens uh, when the Antichrist reveals himself. So when the Antichrist reveals himself, there will be exactly seven years to the day that, that it takes for Jesus to... The seven-year tribulation period won't stretch out to seven and a half or ten. It's going to end at seven, and it's going to end with the coming of Jesus Christ. And this is when Israel's going to see him, and all of Israel will be saved in a day. Come on, that's a good place to get excited. <laughs> So it's 69 weeks, everything went on pause. What's in the middle? The church age, that's you and I. I'm so thankful that God reached out to the Gentiles so that we could be saved. If if they would have just accepted Messiah and God redeemed his people, we'd still be lost in our sins. 
The scripture tells us not to look down on the Jews. Why? God has not rejected them. He still keeps covenant with them. He is focused on them. He will redeem them. He's coming back to reveal himself to them. But thank God for the gap. We are the people of the gap that God poured out his mercy and his love and that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. Amen. So 69 out of 70 weeks have passed Uh, The seven-year tribulation will cap off the last week. God will accomplish everything in Israel he said he would, but it won't start until the end of the church age and the revealing of the Antichrist. Seven years after that, Jesus will return and every eye will see him and Israel will receive him and the millennial reign will begin. Amen. So you say, how could Daniel possibly know all this? Only if God revealed it to him. How could it possibly be so historically accurate to the month that Jesus appears and he's presented to the Jews and Artaxerxes give his command? Only by God. Now we have a chart that helps us see a timeline of all this. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Starts with Artaxerxes' command to Nehemiah. Takes him seven weeks, 49 years to rebuild. You add 62 weeks to it. You get up to that place where there's now the cutoff, uh, where Messiah is cut off, he's killed. You see the gap there? That's you and I. That's where the church age is. How long is it? We don't know for sure, but uh, understand the end will come to a screeching halt when Antichrist uh, is either revealed or breaks his covenant. There's some discrepancy about what scholars think about that, but the 70th week will begin, the tribulation will begin, and at the end of it, Messiah will return. So I encourage you, if you want to see how this lays out in a visual way so that you can ingest it and grab hold of it, after service, come grab yourself a copy of the chart. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, for the prophet Daniel. I thank you uh, for prophecy in Scripture that you have not left us clueless, but you've given us all kinds of clues and insight. You've told us to look for the signs of your coming. Father, I pray, even though we don't know uh, the time or the day, Lord, we can see the signs of the times. And Lord, we know it's time for the church to be the church to preach the gospel, to, to reach out for those who are half in and half out, to, co- to confront those who are stuck in the mire of sin and to bring them out of the darkness and into the light. God, give us the same sense of urgency that Daniel had. He humbled himself, he prayed, he fasted, he covered himself in sackcloth and ashes. Lord, let us be desperate for souls. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Give him praise this morning.